Hi, and welcome to our third video in our evolution unit. Here we're going to talk about the modern synthesis. Up to now we've talked about Darwinian mechanics of evolution, which definitely work and definitely are one of the major driving forces of evolutionary biology. But of course, Darwin lived in the 1800s. A lot has happened in biology from the time that Darwin died until the modern day. And particularly, our understanding of genetics has advanced considerably from conceptions of inheritance during Darwin's time. Darwin had no understanding of genetics or DNA, and his attempts to explain the mechanisms of inheritance and variation in the origin of species definitely reflect that fact. They're almost comically wrong in retrospect, but we can't hold that against him. He just didn't have access to the body of knowledge that has developed in the past hundred years with regard to these concepts. The fusion of Darwinian mechanics of evolution with our modern understanding of genetics is referred to as the modern synthesis. And it's important that we take a moment to discuss it so that we're all grounded in an up-to-date understanding of how evolution works. The question we're going to try to answer here is how do populations actually evolve? In this video, we're going to talk about the modern synthesis, and we're then going to connect our understandings of evolutionary biology to concepts from modern genetics, specifically the allele concept and gene pools. As I said at the beginning, the modern synthesis is simply taking evolutionary theory and connecting it to modern genetics. Let's pause and let's make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to our understanding of modern genetics. Genetic information is stored in molecules of DNA in every cell on the planet. We can think of that DNA as being broken up into a series of instructions that we refer to as genes. That information is first copied into a molecule of RNA. And then that RNA copy of the DNA gene is used by the cell in order to build a protein. The actions of the proteins that are present in the cells of any organism are what drive the production of traits or what we refer to as phenotypes in the organism. In this particular example, we're going to focus on the eye color phenotype in these fictitious smiley faced organisms. Of course, it's also really important to understand that it's not just genetic information that drives the production of phenotypes. The environment also plays a role, but living systems have no control over the environment. The only aspects of inheritance that living systems can influence are those aspects that are stored in the genetic information inside every cell. This is a modern understanding of how genetic information is transmitted, and it's well beyond anything that Darwin ever understood. When we think about the relationship between genes and phenotypes, it's useful to understand that there are different versions of any particular gene. The term that we use to refer to a different version of any gene is an allele. Here we see the effects of two different alleles for eye color. We can think about these alleles as two different versions of that DNA gene that codes for the proteins that result in eye color. One allele, which will symbolize as a big B, codes for the phenotype of brown eyes, whereas the other allele, which will symbolize as a little b, codes for the phenotype of blue eyes. In any sexually reproducing organism, there's going to be two copies of every gene, or two alleles for every gene. One that's inherited from the mother, and one that's inherited from your father. Looking at our eye color example, we see that if you inherit two big B alleles, you'll have brown eyes. But also if you inherit a big B and a little b allele, you'll also have brown eyes. The term that we use to describe this situation is dominance. We said the big B allele is dominant over the little b allele because it only takes one copy of the big B allele to drive the production of the brown eye color phenotype. On the other hand, we say that the little b allele is recessive because you need to have two little b alleles in order to have blue eyes. Another way of saying this is that the genotype of an organism determines the phenotype of the organism. We should also pause here to acknowledge that this eye color example that I'm using is an oversimplification of how eye color is actually inherited. At the same time, it's a useful simplification for us to keep in our minds for the purpose of the discussion that we're going to have going forward. So absolutely, the actual inheritance of eye color in humans is much more complex than this simple situation suggests. At the same time, the inheritance of eye color in our fictitious smiley organisms is as simple as it seems. A big B is the brown eye allele, a little B is the blue eye allele, and the brown eye allele is dominant to the blue eye allele. Another concept that's really useful for our modern understanding of evolution is this notion of the gene pool. This refers to all of the alleles among all of the members of a population in a particular environment. In this example, we have 20 different smiley organisms in our environment. Some have brown eyes and some have blue eyes. We know all of the blue-eyed individuals have the genotype little b, little b, and that our brown-eyed individuals are either big b, big b, or big b, little b, depending upon the particulars of their genotype. If we were to tally up all of the different genotypes that we see in our environment and list them, that would represent the gene pool of the smileys. I'm going to do some math now and I'll walk you through it. All I'm going to do is I'm going to list the numbers and then frequencies of the big B and little b alleles here in our smiley population during this generation, which we'll refer to as generation one. We see that there are 15 big b alleles out of the 40 total, and there are 25 little b alleles. 
So the frequency of the big B allele is 0 0.375, 15 out of 40. And the frequency of the little B allele is 0 0.625, or 25 out of 40. Instead of defining evolution as differential reproductive success or survival of the fittest, we can instead define evolution as change in the allele frequencies in a population over time. Now, I'm not saying that any of those previous definitions of evolution do not apply. They absolutely do. All I'm saying is that this is another way of defining evolution that incorporates our modern understandings of genetics, gene pools, and allele frequencies. Let's look at how this works from generation to generation here in our smiley population. In generation two, we see that there's a shift in the frequencies of the big B and the little b alleles. Specifically, we see that there's been an increase in the number of brown-eyed individuals and a decrease in the number of blue-eyed individuals. Whether or not this is due to natural selection or some other evolutionary force is not important for our discussion right now. What is important is the recognition that the frequencies of the alleles in our gene pool has changed. Here in generation three, we can see that the allele frequencies have changed again, with the number of blue-eyed individuals decreasing even further and the number of brown-eyed individuals increasing as a result. Note that in each generation, the allele frequencies for big B and little b have changed. By definition, that means that our smiley population is evolving from one generation to the next. We see that our big B allele is increasing over time, and our little b allele is decreasing over time. Let's pause here and talk about another misconception that people frequently have when thinking about evolution, which is the idea that an individual evolves. Individuals cannot evolve because their genotype is static from birth through death. Evolution is a property of populations of organisms. It's an example of a broad phenomenon that we see in biological systems known as emergence, where one level of organization, in this case the population level, has properties that we don't see in the level of organization below it, in this case the individual level. Individuals are born, they survive, they reproduce or they don't, and they die. They pass on their alleles, certainly. But evolution can only refer to the population, since in order for evolution to occur, the gene pool's allele frequencies have to change. Individuals certainly are fit or are not fit, but it's the population as a whole that evolves. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of the modern synthesis. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how modern evolutionary theory integrates our modern understanding of genes and inheritance. Also make sure that you can describe how evolution results in a change in a population's allele frequencies. If you can do those, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.